Nomenclature for covalent compounds, or naming binary covalent compounds. Okay, so first thing we want to do is get an overview of covalent or molecular compounds. And these compounds are held together with covalent bonds as opposed to ionic bonds. So everything we've been discussing up to now has been ionic bonds. Now we're going to talk about covalent bonds. Now, the way that you can identify a covalent compound or a molecular compound is if you see nonmetals bonded together. So no metals will be present and it will not be it will not start with H. So in other words, it's not an acid. Okay? So we want to look for nonmetals bonded together in these compounds. And we're going to name simple ones binary covalent. That just means two. So two different types of nonmetals bonded together. And in covalent bonds, electrons are shared between atoms. Okay? So that's the big difference. So these nonmetals are going to share electrons with each other. And we're also going to remember, you know, just in contrast, that in ionic compounds, the cation loses an electron, the anion gains an electron, or it can be more than one, lost or gained. And that's going to create charged ions, which are held together with electrostatic attractions. So that's in contrast to covalent bonds, where we don't have any charges at all. Nonmetals are just sharing electrons with each other. Okay, so let's look at a few examples of these covalent compounds. Okay, now if you're not careful, you might think that this is a polyatomic right here. Okay, but look, no charge, overall neutral compound, and this is something you've definitely heard of before, carbon dioxide. Okay, and so we have two nonmetals bonded together. There's no charge here, so it's not a polyatomic ion. It's just carbon dioxide. Same thing goes for sulfur trioxide. If you're not careful, you might think that that is another polyatomic ion. But it's an overall neutral compound, no charge, and it's sulfur is a nonmetal, oxygen is a nonmetal, so it's a covalent compound. Electrons are shared in that compound. All right, here's, an, here's another one, carbon tetrafluoride. Okay, carbon and fluorine are involved in this guy. And then also phosphorus pentachloride. Okay, now, this is in red for a reason, okay? So now, I'm going to introduce some prefixes that we're going to use to tell people how many of each type of atom there is in the compound. Now, you cannot use these prefixes for your ionic compounds that we already learned to name. So we are learning a different naming scheme for covalent compounds, and we should not go back and apply it to ionic compounds that we've already learned, okay? All right, so first thing you want to do before you start naming your compound is make sure you have a covalent compound. All right, so check to make sure that both elements in the compound are nonmetals and make sure it's not an acid. You need to do that very first because if this compound doesn't fit into that category, you need to go to different naming rules. All right, and each name of a covalent compound, it'll have two words. So the first word in the name will tell us two things, what each element is and how many there are, okay? So for the first word, what the element is and how many of them. The second word, what the element is and how many of them, okay? So each word in the name will tell us that information. Okay, so let's go ahead and pick apart carbon dioxide to see where this is going, because I think it's easier to learn this if you start with an example. All right, so here we have carbon and then oxygen, okay? So the first element in the compound is carbon. So the first word in the name is just the name of the element. There's only one of them, okay? So we're just going to write carbon. That's the first word in the name. The second element in this compound is oxygen and there are two oxygens. And so we're going to see that we can indicate the number of oxygens or other element by just adding a prefix, okay? Now, another thing that we are going to do that we did with the other compounds is we're going to hack off that 
Egen. So hack off the end of the name, take the root, so ox, and we're going to add this IDE, so oxide, and then there's two of them, so dye, dioxide. Okay? So basically, when we say carbon dioxide, we're telling people that there's one carbon and two oxygens in this covalent compound. Okay, so here are the prefixes. And again, do not apply these to ionic compounds. We balance charges in ionic compounds. For covalent compounds, we have to tell people how many there are. We can't balance charges because we're not talking about ionic compounds. Okay, so here are the prefixes. So mono, one, di, for two of them, okay, tri, three of them, all of us have heard of those, tetra, for four, that one might be a little different, penta, five, hexa, six, hepta, seven, octa, for eight, nona, for nine, and deca, for ten, okay? So we're going to use these prefixes on each word in the name of the covalent compound to tell people how many of each atom there are. Okay, so here are the rules for naming covalent compounds. So the first thing we want to do, of course, is to see how many of each element is present. Now, of course, this is saying that we've identified that we have a covalent compound. We have two nonmetals bonded together. So the first thing we're going to do is look and see how many of each element is present. So the first word in the name is going to be the element name with the prefix added for how many there are, okay? Now, if there's only one atom of the first element, like we did with carbon dioxide, then we're going to leave off that mono. So we're not going to say monocarbon dioxide. We're just going to say carbon dioxide, okay? For the second part of the name, we're going to write the root of the second element. So we're going to hack off the ending. We're going to add IDE, and then we're going to add the appropriate prefix, however many there are. Okay, so going back to carbon dioxide, so carbon is the first part of the name, and we only had one, so we left off the mono because it's the first part of the name. And then we had two oxygens, and we changed the ending to IDE, so we have dioxide. Okay, so here are a few other details about naming covalent compounds. Now, usually the less electronegative element is placed first in the compound or it's listed first in the name. This is usually true, okay? But we haven't learned how to predict the relative electronegativity of elements yet. Now, when the name of the element begins with a vowel and the prefix ends in O, then sometimes we end up with a really awkward two vowels in a row, and that can be kind of hard to say. So when that happens, one of the two vowels is kind of dropped in the name, and you'll get the hang of this as you go along. But for instance, this compound here, dinitrogen pentaoxide, okay? So see how that's kind of, you know, a mouthful here, pentaoxide. It's actually going to be pronounced dinitrogen pentaoxide. So we're kind of going to drop that A. Okay, so go ahead and try naming these compounds. So pause the presentation and give it a try, and we'll go through each one. Okay, so first one. Okay, so both elements in the compound are nonmetals. Nitrogen, nonmetal. Oxygen, nonmetal. So we need to use covalent naming rules. All right, so we've established that we're using covalent rules. Good. So now the first element is nitrogen, and there's only one of them. So the first word is just simply nitrogen. The second element is oxygen, and there are two. And so we're going to take the root of the name. We're going to add di for two. We're going to add the ending IDE, and we're going to end up with nitrogen dioxide. So that's directly analogous to carbon dioxide. Okay, so now, again, they're both nonmetals, so we're using covalent naming rules. Check. So the first element in this compound is sulfur. And there are two of these guys this time. So we're going to add the prefix di, and we're just going to keep the name of the element the same. So we just have disulfur. And the second element is chlorine. And there are two of them. So we're, again, we're going to take the root of the name, 
We're going to hack off that ending, that een. We're going to add id, okay? Add the prefix di. And so we end up with disulfur dichloride. So that just says 2 sulfur, 2 chloride. Okay, so here's another one. And again, both nonmetals, so it's a covalent compound. Good. All right, the first element is carbon. There's only one of them, so we're just going to write carbon. We're not going to write monocarbon. All right, we're just going to write carbon. The second element is bromine. We're going to take off the ene, add the ide. So now we have bromide. We look up there, and there are four of those guys. So now we have tetra bromide. So the name of the compound is tetra, uh, carbon tetrabromide. All right. So I bet you guys can guess this one. Another directly analogous compound. Okay. First element is silicon. And there's only one. So the first word is silicon. The second element, oxygen. There's two of them. And we are going to take the root of the name, put IDE on it, and the prefix, and we end up with silicon dioxide. Okay, so now let's turn this around for this mini quiz. Now, I haven't shown you how to do this, but I think you guys can do it. All right, so what I want you to do is write the formula for each one of these names. So use the prefixes to tell you how many of each one there is, okay? and try to figure out which element it is. Most of the time it should be pretty easy, okay? Feel free to get a list of elements with their symbol if you don't recognize antimony, for instance, if you don't know the symbol for that, okay? All right, hexaboron monosilicide. So hexa means six, so that means there's six boron atoms, and mono means one, so there's one silicon. So we have B6Si. All right, another analogous one to carbon dioxide. This is chlorine dioxide. So we have chlorine dioxide, one chlorine atom, and two oxygen atoms. All right, antimony tri triiodide. All right, we know there's only one antimony. We looked on a list. If we didn't have it memorized, we found out the elemental symbol for antimony is SB. Okay, and we know we have three iodines because it's triiodide, so we're going to put I3. And then finally, for our last one, we have nitrogen trifluoride. And so we have one nitrogen atom. And trifluoride means three, so three fluorine atoms. So we have NF3.